Chongqing in western China, the new megacity of the 21st century, the fastest growing metropolis in the world. An estimated 30 million people live here, and around 1,000 people are moving to this urban center every day in their quest for work and somewhere to live. Urbanization breaks like a tidal wave over the once sparsely populated landscape. Constant immigration forces the city upwards, and the increasing traffic slows down movement within it. The city threatens to collapse under its own enormous size. But what is the root cause? And what alternatives are there? Chinese megacities grow from the margins. They are the product of a mass migration, the likes of which has never been seen before. From all parts of the country, but above all from the poorer west of China, peasant farmers settle on the outskirts of the large cities. From these satellite settlements, they set off early each morning to find work in the city. If they succeed, the improvised settlements grow, and the city continues to expand. People do shocking things to themselves in order to change to an urban life. They endure terrible housing situations. They endure the loss of privacy. They endure living beside superhighways and, and and sewage lagoons and, and airports. They endure constant noise, terrible smells, crime, the danger of physical harm to the self. They work impossibly long hours at very bad jobs and so on. Entirely because there's a gamble that they're taking, usually not on behalf of themselves, but on behalf of their children. The migrants want to become citizens of the cities so that their children can go to school there. Education is the precondition for a better life. And thus the megacity on the banks of the Yangtze continues to grow inexorably. Like most metropolises of the world, it grows around a city in which banks, offices, and company headquarters are highly concentrated. The city becomes a magnet for migrants embodying the idea of success and prosperity. That immigrant district, the arrival city, is the core machine of the cultural and economic operation of the city. You cannot imagine New York City or London or Paris without those cities being networks of people who've arrived from some other part of the world who are using the space around them, using the resources around them, using the networks that they create amongst themselves to transform the city and create new economies, to create new middle classes, to create new forms of culture, new forms of food, new forms of living, new forms of dialect and language and so on. The, the basic vital life of the city is the arrival city. It's not a sideshow. It's the main machine that makes cities run. Uh, if a city stops having arrival city districts, you know that it's a dead city that's going to be either collapsing or becoming a museum devoted to its former self. Doug Saunders' theses are already affecting the way city planners of the 21st century work. There have been attempts in the past to prevent mass migration and to view informal settlements as a temporary phenomenon. His research has led to the acceptance that they are the starting point of further open growth in the city centers, an integral part of a city. The influx of more than 1,000 people each day makes any kind of planning very difficult. Traffic has become an existential problem in urban areas. For most Chinese, a car is a symbol of status and prosperity. 
cities like Shanghai try to regulate traffic by raffling car registrations. The public transport system always lags behind the demands of a fast-growing city. In China, everything's happening and happening uh, so fast. So there is no uh, planning or architecture design in a proper approach. I would say it's in chaos. So for architects and even planners, we cannot control it. Even our government, a very strong, strong one, cannot control it. So for us, it's like a reaction to do what is happening. So it's always behind the schedule. Only around half of the 31 million inhabitants of this largest city in the world actually live within the city boundaries. The other half live in the surrounding areas. From there, many millions of people travel every day into the city center, where offices are concentrated, where people build, work, and consume. By night, in the glamour of the neon lights, the magnetic attraction of the new megacities becomes tangible. Compared to the hardships in the countryside, this glittering world must seem like paradise. This panorama is a symbol of the hopes and aspirations of all the migrants for a better future. And it is this hope that has led to the explosive growth of megacities the world over. Chongqing is the largest and most powerful among them, a new New York in Asia. Taking the high-speed train from Shanghai to Beijing, this vast country flies past during the more than 1,000-kilometer-long route. The entire country is transformed, and this transformation seems to imitate the tempo of the train. Everywhere new factories and settlements are springing up. New cities are being born and new traffic. The country is turning into an urban society. The shift is palpable when you race across the country. Beijing could be the first city in the world that is literally suffocating in its own traffic. The new districts are structured in concentric circles around the old urban core. New arterial roads are constantly being added to cope with the growing traffic, but it is never enough. Traffic is regulated, but the excessive amount is beyond regulation. The reason? New districts do not have the same attraction as the old organically involved center with its forbidden city and its nearby parks. In planning the new cities, it's imperative to learn from the example of the old quarters. This demands one of China's world-renowned architects. Chinese architects have very little time to reflect. They take part in the urbanization process without taking a moment to think about it. I think with such a rapid development, we have lost many interesting aspects that we could have done better. If contemporary Chinese architects had paid more attention to the natural environment, or had thought more about geography, about topography, about climate, and most of all about the things that are unique to Chinese culture and very different from Western culture, like the impressionistic and half-abstract spirit of art, then our cities would have many more unique characteristics. The Chinese language has no word for city. It knows only the village and now the megacity. Places like old Beijing had their feudal palaces surrounded by the hutongs, districts made up of a large number of one- or two-story houses lining narrow streets. This courtyard house is a multi-generational house consisting of several buildings arranged around a central inner courtyard. 
In Chinese, these hutongs are also given the English term courtyard house. Peizhou reconstructed this house in Beijing's old center. On the one hand, there is the Chinese culture, which is so different from Western culture. There is a different approach, a different way of seeing. And then there is China's natural landscape. The Chinese natural landscape is, in my opinion, very different from Western landscapes. Landscaping elements like trees and water are essential components of the old residential areas of Beijing. Districts consisting only of houses and streets are not reconcilable with Chinese tradition, according to Peizhou. The tradition of neighborhoods and communally used residential areas are aspects some of the most modern Chinese architects are trying to reintegrate into their work. For them, the hutongs are a benchmark, a kind of archetype that planners need to consider in the much larger and more densely planned new city districts that are now being built. How cities can develop when they fail to observe this scale can be seen in the residential districts of Ordos, a recently built million-strong city in Inner Mongolia. This is what progress looks like when it goes wrong. The new Ordos was supposed to be China's Dubai, a metropolis in the desert. In fact, what it is, is a collection of eight-lane highways, skyscrapers, and luxurious apartments, but hardly any people. Instead of the 300,000 for whom this new district was planned, a mere 5,000 people have settled here. It's a ready-made ghost town, and there are several of these here in China. Once again, the dilemma of new Chinese cities is revealed. They have no time to grow organically. They are built here in the middle of the desert too soon or too late, and often lack a true center. A center is something one of China's new architects has now designed for Ordos. Ordos belongs to Mongolia culture. Uh, like Norman culture, uh, we, we can say tri um, uh, local culture. But the local term come from mainstream culture. And the local people, let's say the local government, they don't want to become local culture. Right? They also want to merge into the modern culture. So I think they were in the crisis, uh, like, uh, in the process of modernization, how they express themselves. This museum is designed to become the new center of Ordos. It stands like a cross between a gigantic tent and a battered spaceship in the middle of nowhere in a city with a future. I was thinking maybe we should just put something so abstract uh, has no reference, uh, no reference to the time and the, and the other culture, just put there. Maybe something new will, you know, will, will come to this object. So, so we did this uh, a, a bubble or spaceship like form, look very futuristic, so it doesn't look belong to Earth or anywhere. <laughs> on this earth. Upon entering this elegantly curved spaceship for the 21st century, you're initially overwhelmed by the spaciousness inside, by the height, the light, the generously curved stairways. 
This building could also be the town hall of a city that believes in its own future. It is a fantastic space. It's many floating walkways reminiscent of the film Metropolis. And it also has the feel of a very high tent whose stability is only secured by the internal girding and struts. The small and large dents are like bulges in a tent caused by the wind. And we have two sunlight like this, one here, one on the other side, and inside is lobby. And the main building is solid because the cold weather over there. So during the day, you don't need any artificial lighting in this museum, in the public space. I see this building as a, as a generator. Uh, maybe something new will happen in the future because currently, uh, you can say this building is good. It's belong to to local or not belong to to this local, but no answer. You don't know yet. The museum is supposed to function as a magnet, to bring together what beforehand was unconnected. There is still a lot of space in this new city in the far north of China. The museum is the symbol of the future, positioned so that you can see it from afar and to know you have arrived in the city of Ordos. The Bay of Hong Kong. You could say that Hong Kong is the mother of all Asian megacities. It is the blueprint for urbanization that began here and in Tokyo during the 1960s. This is where the characteristics of all Asian metropolises were delineated. High density and permanent reconstruction raising the issue of structure and balance in these vertically exploding cities. These issues have fascinated renowned German photographer Peter Bielabreski over many years. He photographs major and megacities and calls them the neon cities of our time. What he is searching for and what attracts him is the chaos, the density, the cramped conditions. Everything appears to be inhomogeneous. However, there must be an underlying structure. It is, after all, the living environment for several hundred million people in China alone. When when you're here like this, you could get the impression that it is a place in transition. Buildings that are only 20 years old are torn down and replaced by new ones. And as a European who lives in a house that is around 100 years old and where everyone thinks this will probably still be fine for another 100 years, and where we see that as a positive, you could become a little confused by that. But I think that that perfectly epitomizes the fact that we are always dealing with impermanence. We cannot stop time. That is intrinsic to life. Things are constantly changing. And here such change becomes extremely tangible and visceral. I don't believe that is a bad thing, perhaps on the contrary. Perhaps people here are essentially more flexible than those in Europe, because we always think everything will remain the same. It simply won't. Compared with European metropoles like Rome, Vienna or Madrid, with their homogeneously evolved city districts, there is an extremely high density here. There seems to be no room for public spaces and parks. Instead, everything is functional. Living, working, travel, and cramped chaos. But what this chaos represents above all, despite the noise and the dirt, is vitality. That is what Bialybreski tries to capture. 
That is the reason why he climbs up onto roofs or onto the platforms of high-rise, multi-story car parks. Seen from a distance, this city looks like a graphical patchwork, like a three-dimensional variable construction kit. It is easy to forget the dimensions involved. It is an enormous city, and many thousands live here within this grid work, for which there is simply no counterpart in Europe. The density is palpable in these photographs. They freeze fragments of the inexorable process of becoming. They are transfixed images of a chaotic vitality. It's a little bit as though the city were being reinvented here. This principle we have in Europe that someone came along one day, laid down his bundle at the river's edge and then others came and settled, followed by the traders, then a city wall was built. That kind of growth happened here instantly. Here in Hong Kong, a building has to recoup the investment after 12 years. After that, it is taken as a given that it can be demolished, whereas in Europe it takes 30 years. Hong Kong has long been one of the biggest tourist attractions and one of the richest cities in the world. A paradise for the rich man as the saying goes in China. A global finance center that has long ago outgrown its cheap manufacturing reputation. What you still feel in Hong Kong is its incredible vitality. The marked will to improve oneself through education, in housing, in prosperity within a very confined space. That's why Hong Kong is today considered a kind of role model for the development of all Chinese megacities. You can see here, in a time shift, what began all over China only 20 years ago. The explosion of the cities the epic of raging urbanization. Separated from Hong Kong, only by a river and a metro line, lies Shenzhen, the city with the highest per capita income in China. Until the beginning of the 1980s, Shenzhen was a small town with only 30,000 citizens. It was then declared a special economic zone and, as the little sister of the larger Hong Kong, it grew to become a city of more than 10 million people. And it is continuing to grow. The city is an international business center, but the living quarters of the new arrivals are clustered like vertical Mikado sticks. Shenzhen too is a city that is constantly building. Its prosperity and success are being translated into ever new, improved, and higher altitude living quarters. And so the city has to tear down what has only stood for perhaps five or 10 years. It is simply an expression of a massively growing population that simply has to go somewhere. They aren't doing anything other than what we do, consuming, providing for themselves. But you can bet they release less CO2 than we do. I think what we find strange is simply the speed with which this is happening. This transformation has something monumental about it. And so the photographs of Peter Bialabreski 
have an unintentional pathos. They are like documents of, or testaments to, a city that knows no rest. I think that photography is inherently a medium that captures the time it is reporting on. That is, so to speak, when it takes the phenomena of its time seriously. So to that extent, the documentary aspect of it, what it captures, always becomes a contemporary witness too, so that in 40 years' time we will see that's what it was like. As Europeans, it is this constant coming and going that leaves us clueless. But how could it be done differently? How can you plan a perfect city like Paris with this level of growth? Peter Bielabreski tries to capture that monumental upheaval that creates a megacity. The pace and the power have something theatrical about them. With its exploding cities, China will change the culture of the 21st century. It has the will to be in the forefront, in the vanguard of the international competition among urban centers in the global economy. Nothing symbolizes this more than the competition to build the highest skyscrapers that has spread throughout Asia. Here in Shenzhen, the Pingang International Financial Center is under construction. It is scheduled to be completed by 2016 and will be 660 meters tall. Shenzhen will then have the edge compared to competing cities like Shanghai and Chongqing. But probably only for a few years. Size and height symbolize economic power and progress and are the reasons for the constant fight for aerial mastery among the Asian megacities. Shenzhen long ago overtook Hong Kong in terms of population. Both cities together comprise one of China's economic centers, and the magnetic pull of this twin city on all the people leaving the countryside continues to this day. The expansion of the city demands a certain structure. Cultural buildings should take on this function for the metropolises. The Chinese state declared that all new million-sized cities should have at least three of these. And so, Shenzhen has built one of the most exciting museums in the world. The design museum was here first. When I began my design, this planning zone was built with large-scale commercial buildings. And so in this context, the question was raised as to how a cultural building, as a meeting place for people, could be differentiated from other rather trivial commercial buildings. That was the puzzle I wanted to solve. Spectacular buildings for the public raise the prestige and the value of the surrounding areas. The same goes for Europe. The Pompidou Centre in Paris, 
or the Guggenheim in Bilbao have provided a new identity to entire city districts. We managed to integrate the building by using diffusely reflecting materials on which, for example, only the shadows of people approaching the building are reflected. The changing sky, whether in the morning or at midday or evening, as well as other changes in the environment, all become visible on the building. I call buildings like this disappearing or invisible buildings. I think that is a method rooted in Chinese culture, concealing oneself. With these two motives, we have succeeded in making the building harmonious, sometimes highly noticeable and sometimes almost invisible. The design has something wonderful about it. It is suggestive, very sensual, and at the same time a meditative form. Not a UFO, but rather a thought, an idea. An idea that people can return to a certain harmony and find balance in this new world, and can still feel secure and encouraged when they see this form and experience the space within, gliding through it like a cloud. The Design Museum by Peju is built for the future, and at the same time, it creates a bridge to a spirituality rooted in China's past. Seen from the outside, the museum is a self-contained structure, but if you go inside, you have a sense of unlimited space. The curvature of the building is perfect in itself. It's like in the work of the American artist James Turrell. With his installations, he wants to create an infinite space in order to irritate customary human perception and expand it. Normally in museums you find white walls hung with artworks. And according to convention, you would present industrial works of art like cars on the floor. But in our case, cars can float in the space. And the people? They too can float, because there is no scale and no real boundary. It feels as though, instead of walking on the ground, you are floating through the space. In Paris or Bilbao, the new museums attract millions of visitors every year. It will take a while before this effect can be seen in China. But in comparison to European cities, Shenzhen is a product of the turn of the century. Perhaps Peju's museum will soon become a destination where one can find peace without losing touch with the world of the 21st century. This university campus lies somewhat outside Hangzhou, a city about 200 kilometers southwest of Shanghai. Hangzhou is the center of an entire metropolitan region the city proper has over 8 million inhabitants, yet few people have ever heard of it in Europe. One of China's most significant architects lives here. With this campus, he has provided a form of counter-design to a city that is condensing itself vertically. He picks up on traditional forms of Chinese architecture, unapologetically using old materials like wood and tiles, which he combines with concrete, iron, and steel to create a traditional modern form. I think that for people's lives, it is important to live in harmony with history and tradition. For example, on TV, you often see a scene in which someone has lost their memory. After that, everything is terrible. Their whole life is turned upside down. If you look at Chinese cities, you see that almost all of our cities have lost their memory. That is a terrible situation. And that's why we talk about history and tradition. They are an essential element in our daily lives. The Zhongzhan Road is a street in the old center of Hangzhou. The architect had no professional license at the beginning of his career, and so he was not able to plan any large projects. So he spent almost 10 years doing modest restorational work. 
Every day he would go to the building sites with the craftsmen and learn everything he could from them about construction and materials. Supervised by him, the Zhongzhan Renovation Project set out to prove that you can successfully combine all districts of the city with new buildings. I see my work as applying traditional techniques to modern buildings. Traditionally, because of the statics, you can only build to a height of six meters. But with the Ningbo Museum, we built up to 24 meters. That is the challenge. How can you use traditional experience, but at the same time satisfy the technical demands of a modern building and so take that experience to a higher level? Wang Shu restored old sections and combined them with new concrete constructions. The project aims to inspire a radically different way of thinking about large-scale planning. All buildings are not intrinsically bad and are also not inimical to modern usage. That is what the architect wishes to demonstrate. Another new housing development in Hangzhou has caused a furor throughout the world. It looks like a pile of stacked building blocks, like shipping containers. Only on closer inspection you see they are single-family homes stacked on top of one another. A problem that often comes up with high-rise buildings is you don't really know where you live. You just know that you live somewhere in an abstract high building. That's why I wanted to design a new type of high-rise in which you can clearly define where you live. So, I stacked 200 courtyards, traditional courtyard-style houses, on top of one another, and the result was a high-rise with courtyards. The idea was quite simple. Even if you live 100 meters up in this house, you have the distinct feeling of living in a two-story house. If you are standing outside in front of the house, you can show your friend, look, see up there where the osmanthus tree is growing. That's exactly where I live. So you can really show other people exactly where you live. Around 800 people live in these six apartment buildings that have a concave form as well as appearing layered. The housing complex references the motif of a traditional southern Chinese city, but it is condensed into a modern housing form. It's my aim to create a kind of neighborhood feeling in the faceless modern high-rises. People see their neighbors again. They see, yes, actually over there in my neighbor's garden there is a new tree being planted. And on this side of the apartment, they are receiving visitors and drinking a tea together in the garden. You will see that I am building the houses with curves. That means you can see much more of those living across from you. You can see each other as neighbors. That is the key to my design. The city of Ningbo is a six million strong city in the highly populated area around the Yangtze River estuary. Ningbo too is a very young and extremely fast growing city. The apartment high rises grow like Mikado sticks into the sky and everywhere large new business districts are springing up. Somewhat outside this new center, down by the river, lies an unrepossessing new build that seems to blend into the old building structure like a warehouse. It is the Ningbo Museum of Art, also designed by Wang Shu. Back then, I imagined that we had to integrate the old harbor into the design. And my hope was that the museum would keep alive the memories of the people who lived around this old port. They used to take the ferry from here to Shanghai and to Putuo, one of the sacred mountains. That's why my design has two bridges, as though one could still leave here by boat. I want to keep those memories alive, and I don't want my museum to distort those memories.
in a park directly opposite the new build. High rises stretching to the sky, Wangshu has created an ensemble of pavilions and tea houses. They too combine modern usage with old materials. They want to express that even in this time of limitless growth, simplicity and modesty are also possible. They underline the fact that there is also room for a quiet architecture that represents the future. All buildings have a kind of inner strength. They appear like physical manifestations of a will to differentiate, perhaps solely to demonstrate that there can be a different way of doing things. I'm very interested in the cities that have not obstructed the view to the open horizon. In contrast, our new cities all consist largely of high-rises and they obstruct the view of the landscape. Paris is wonderful. To this day you can recognize the topographical differences in the city. I want to give people just that feeling too, of finding themselves in front of a broad horizon. Large cities are like tremendous force fields. Compressed, they concentrate millions of people in a confined space. They focus their energy and will, which is why cities have always been synonymous with the progress of civilization. In the era of urbanization, the direction and quality of this progress is being decided above all in the cities of Asia. In the exploding centers, which we call megacities, 